G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel for a full, all-encompassing draft review. Uh, I thought of a few different ways to um, format this video, and the way I'm going to do it is simply go through each team alphabetically and talk about the players that they've got in, their general mix, and how I think their draft went, and I guess just a little bit of commentary for you. So, uh, obviously the draft finished off earlier today, I'll probably release this tomorrow, because um, I've got a few videos on the go at the moment, busy time of the year. It was an eventful draft, We, uh, you typically see, you know, bolters and sliders, so that wasn't a, a surprise in itself, we did see a very early bolt in Phoenix Goddard, um, but bolts in general are kind of normal. What we did see was a fair amount of sliders though, that still got taken. Um, the interesting theme among all those sliders was a lack of leg speed. Well, the three that come to mind, probably um, Ari Schoenberg, Ollie Murphy, and perhaps George Stevens you can include in that as well, and Jack Deline, perhaps the other one as well. It uh, doesn't mean they're not going to be good players, but just an interesting trend among the players that uh, went later than we expected. I am recording this before the rookie draft. I'm not sure when I'll release it yet, so we're just talking about national draft picks as it currently stands. So... Before we get into it, if you could do me a favor and hit subscribe. Uh, I did set that goal of hitting 24K by draft day. You guys helped me absolutely smash it. Um, did it with a day to spare. So um, thank you very much. But if you are enjoying the content um, and you could consider subscribing, that'd be great because I obviously want to keep growing this channel as much as possible. So let's talk about, firstly, the Adelaide Crows. And uh, they created probably the first big story of the draft by trading up for Dan Curtin. So they moved up a couple of selections um, they gave away a future second, and their second one went back. But at the end of the day, they get Daniel Curtin. They were a team that was uh, needed probably a, a key back, and uh, it's unclear yet whether they see Curtin as that key back or the um, or perhaps a big body inside mid, another need for them. So um, that remains to be seen. I think he will start his career as a probably that third tall, maybe behind Butts and Murray. Maybe he slips into that Dode role because I think that's the best way for him to build confidence and uh, and start to get into the groove of AFL level. Probably by year three is potentially where they could really mix it up and throw him uh, at more stoppages, but I think that's where his career starts. And I think Charlie Edwards as well is that big-bodied midfielder who has a point of difference and something different to their current young mix. Oscar Ryan, I, I'm not going to lie, I didn't know too much about him. I thought he was borderline draftable going into this draft. What I will say is that Adelaide do have a knack of taking some late picks and boulders in general. Bolters, sorry. Uh, that end up coming on uh, one that I can think of is Tom Dodo himself back in 2015 I think it was I taken in the first round hadn't heard of him at the time and uh, I will back Adelaide's judgment in there but uh, nonetheless a big bolter in Oscar Ryan so then the Brisbane Lions they entered the draft at 31 and they walked away with three talls this on the surface level seems like a really good result because I actually anticipated they were only going to take two maybe s suss out the third pick see if there was someone there and evidently there was so the first two picks were both key forwards, albeit undersized key forwards. But I think both of them have the knack in uh, Logan Morris and Luke Lloyd of, um, you know, they're, they're good footballers as well. And that kind of overcomes perhaps the, you know, the height deficiency, although Luke Lloyd could, could grow to 195, 196. They're obviously picking talls now because they've had access to mids over the stretch. And, um, and you know, there's Ashcroft brothers and uh, Jasper Fletcher, Devin Robertson, and uh, of course they've added Reese Torrent as well, but their focus was talls here. So to walk away with two key forwards in the second round where we was kind of littered with talls in the second round and then find Zach, Zane Zakostelski still available at pick 51, I think before even adding Torrent, I think they've certainly set out their, um, well, they've certainly achieved the uh, goals that they had set out going into this draft, which was to pick the best available talls. So I think they've got a bargain there and to take all four picks, um, was a it was a pretty savvy draft I'd say for the Brisbane Lions. Obviously, they're preparing for a future where Harris Andrews isn't there um, and Joe Danaher up front. They're looking at contingencies and they tick those boxes tonight. Then there's the Carlton Football Club who had a short and sweet draft, no first round of this year, and they entered the draft at 29 and exited at 34. Ashton Moore, I think they they were looking for a little bit of forward half spark, I think, and as far as talent goes, Ashton Moore has got it. Fell away down the rankings this year due to reportedly a hip complaint. And uh, I think the upside there is unreal. And I think he could play a role for them day dot. Billy Wilson, by contrast, in a, in a draft log jammed with a lot of running defenders. I didn't expect his name to be called out that early. But they get the um, running creative defender in Billy Wilson out of Victoria. So a short and sweet one for Carlton here. But two players with some upside, definitely. 
which then leaves Collingwood, another team that took two small players and exited the draft in Harry Demetia and Tao Giath. So Demetia is one that really impressed them, uh, obviously, with his football brain. And he's got some athleticism. He's a really quick guy. Whether he settles as a midfielder at the next level, I'm not too sure. But he could certainly be that pressure forward that comes in and plays a role and is physically developed as well. So we could see him earlier than later. And Tal Giath as well. Just adds something a little bit to what most clubs don't actually have as an intercepting defender. And obviously he's got the athleticism like his brother. And it was just an interesting outcome for Collingwood not to pick talls in a draft where there was a lot of talls in the second round. So they walk away without talls, but they just won the premiership. I'm sure they're not too fussy about that. Which brings us to Essendon. Now, Essendon uh, obviously traded up for Nate Caddy. They moved up one spot, gave up pick 31 to the Cats, and they get their man in Nate Caddy, obviously preferring a tall forward rather than a key back like they were linked to in Connor O'Sullivan, and they wouldn't have otherwise been uh, had access to Nate Caddy. So they get their key forward. He's compared to Kerno, and he's got a great, um, what's the word, reach. His, his wingspan is six foot eight. And uh, despite the fact he's a little bit undersized at 193, you think he has the tools to bob up and he, um, for a starter, could uh, continue to grow. But uh, Essendon added a long-term key forward option for them, which is a great result and could probably play early, to be honest, as a bit of a third tall. So then the, the rest of the Essendon's draft, having traded out 31, was interesting, adding two running defenders. Luaman Lual was a little bit of a bargain at, at 39. He was predicted a little bit, probably, to go first round. So to get him in the second round was interesting. But then I think Essendon, um, they were they obviously took three picks. That had Archie Roberts, one of the biggest sliders in this year's draft. Although you'd say leg speed is not an issue for Archie Roberts. Very quick guy. I suppose you could say they contrast each other a little bit. Um, but I suppose in a draft where there were so many running defenders, there was a chance the team was going to double dip. And uh, they get two plays with some rebound and leg speed as well, um, which I think rounds out Essendon's draft nicely. Then we have the Fremantle Dockers, who were an interesting um, case study, I suppose, in this particular draft. They traded up to get Cooper Simpson at pick 35. Then they took a, a slider in Ollie Murphy at 41, the key position defender, before taking another slider in Jack Deleen at pick 60. So honestly, like with the, the range of players there, I think that is actually a really good haul in terms of value. Honestly, if you started day two and told me the Eagles ended up with those three players, I would have gone, yep, yeah, that's ticked a few boxes for us. Um, so for Fremantle, who had worse picks or around about the same sort of picks, I think I'd have to say they've done pretty well. Cooper Simpson has a ton of upside, adds a lot of leg speed to that midfield. Obviously, he's a little bit on the small side and missed a bit of football recently, but there's X Factor there. Ollie Murphy, well-performed key back. Uh, obviously, he's athletic. he has athletic deficiencies, but... Um, I'd say on talent at 41, that, that's a no-brainer. And I wouldn't have minded West Coast to pick him up in that similar range. And that's generally the test of whether I genuinely like a prospect or, or rate a prospect is like how would I feel if West Coast did it. That's why I keep saying stuff like that. It is an interesting move on the whole because their um, list needs weren't fully addressed, at least with their first two picks, which was forward half players. And that's something they... Outwardly said um, after the trade period, they talked about what they were going to get in the draft or aim for. And sometimes it's about down to what players are available. So they did answer the question there with Jack Deleen, and uh, I think they long term will be happy with that at pick 60. I think that's a bargain. Um, again, another player who probably needs to improve his production, maybe his pressure, but he kicks a lot of goals. And uh, that's what you want out of a forward half player. So a good mix there from Fremantle. I think their fans are a little bit disappointed in some respects, but I think they've done very well. Now, Geelong, this was an important draft for them, as I highlighted in a previous video earlier before the draft. Um, I included them as one of my cl the clubs that needed to do well this draft. And I would say they have. And they ended up taking six selections, which is more than any other club. And obviously, going through a transition, that makes sense. But it's the blend of players that interest me. So Connor O'Sullivan, great selection there, a key defender, best available from New South Wales. Uh, sort of Victorian. I think he plays like for the Murray Bush Rangers, but uh, like originally New South Wales, I think. Then they add one of the better tap ruckmen, potentially the best tap ruckman in the draft. Obviously, that's just one aspect of being a ruckman. But Mitch Edwards, I think, as a long-term ruck option, obviously they see him partnering up with Conway as a bit of a double act. Um, I think it made sense for Geelong to go tall with his two picks. So then after that, they went a bit more mature, much like Busher on a Saturday night. Sean Manor was at pick 36, uh, probably the best mature age player on offer. That's quite early for a mature age player. Um, started the VFL grand final. 
And uh, you could see him coming in and again, easing this transition a little bit here. Um, the other two mature ages they got were Ollie Wiltshire, who is, I forget exactly how old he is. He's in his early 20s um, as a small forward. And I think he was playing like amateurs not long ago. But he used to play for the Falcons, so there's a connection there. And Lawson Humphreys, another mature ager, I think he's 20, um, taken out of Western Australia at pick 63. So a couple of mature age selections there, which is interesting. And then George Stevens as well um, from Ballarat, a big bodied inside mid. So getting six players in and a blend of both position attributes, but then also uh, age as well. Um, I think that has kind of ticked a few boxes for Geelong there. And uh, I think this was a good step for them after taking Jai Clark last year. Sorry guys, I'm just gonna pause the video there for one moment to bring you an important message from Druzy's Athlete Academy. Now, as we wrap up the 2023 season, it's time to map out your goals for next season. Now, if you're a young footballer or general athlete, actually, your coach may have highlighted areas for improvement going into next year, such as adding muscle mass, improving your running ability, or enhancing your explosiveness. Now, you probably know where you roughly want to be by the end of preseason, but you're probably unsure about the most effective way to get there. Now, helpfully, Druzy has three years experience working with elite level footballers. As a result, he's learned and applied strength and conditioning strategies that will help deliver concrete results. Now, these results that you're gonna get go beyond just mere numbers you know, superficial stuff like increasing your bench press or trimming a couple of seconds off your 2km time trial. The methods that you get through the Druzy's Athlete Academy are actually tailored to your specific needs as an athlete. Now, beyond these superficial quantifiable gains, the feedback that the athletes at Druzy's Athlete Academy often give are that their training has actually translating in their game going to another level. Some of the feedback has been that people are able to tackle with more force or confidently break away from contests, they're able to kick further and being stronger in marking contests. Now, you know where you want to be by the end of preseason. Druzy has the experience and knowledge and results to get you where you want to be. Now there's a limited time offer through Druzy's Athlete Academy where there are 10 different free one week trials. So essentially all you have to do to express interest in this is go find Druzy's Athlete Academy on Instagram and DM him the message free preseason. I'll leave the information of how to contact Druzy in the description of this video. So these one week trials are fantastic because obviously with no strings attached, you can experience the program risk free. Take action today, start building the foundations for a really strong next season. And if you do end up going through a program for Druzy's Athlete Academy, remember to use the code TRUE4020 for 20% off. Thanks guys, we'll get back to the video now. Then we got the Giants. And uh, this one, I have to say, if I'm being honest, is probably the draft haul that has the, me the least excited, considering the draft hand that they had. So it started when they uh, took Phoenix Goddard at pick 12. Phoenix Goddard is a really athletic small forward and probably will be a good AFL player. And James Leake did slide to pick 17, which on value is really good. Um, I guess I'm just a little bit concerned at this continued tendency to draft players they're scared are going to leave. So Phoenix got that used to be part of their academy. New South Welshman originally, good mates with Conor O'Sullivan. James Leake as a Tasmanian, you could say there is a home go-home threat eventually. Um, but perhaps that's a factor there. And they've spoken openly about um, picking players from a different talent pool. They have to rate players differently. Uh, because of the tendency to leave GWS. So that'd be interesting, and only time will tell on this one. Later in the draft, they added Joe Fonte from WA, a running defender with a, a fair bit of dash. Used to be a midfielder, transitioned back into it being a defender with some success. And then Harvey Thomas, um, a versatile small. He's about 177 centimeters. Plays as a small forward, plays as a small defender. Again, so they just sort of tick some ancillary role kind of boxes in this year's draft. And didn't, with the early picks that they had, you know, I would have thought maybe go for a midfielder. Um, you know, their, their midfield is, the young midfield is pretty good, but you're losing Taranto and Hopper. Since then, they've only drafted Rouston as a pure mid, I think. So I was waiting for that, particularly with a pick in that range. Um, but again, um, it is comes down to which players were available for them. Then the Gold Coast Suns are probably the biggest winner out of this year's draft, it has to be said, with the exception of perhaps North Melbourne. We'll talk about them. But Jed Walter... Ethan Reed, Jake Rogers, and Will Graham. Four selections in the first round. Um, the only awkward thing for them is that they're all bound on three-year contracts now, um, which I'm sure is fine with Gold Coast. But Jed Walter is arguably one of the most talented players in the draft, absolutely. He was taken at pick three or matched at pick three. Ethan Reed, the best ruckman in the draft. Jake Rogers is a really well-performed small midfielder forward um, who uh, got bid on, obviously, at pick 13 by the, or pick 14 by the Swans. 
So um, a good result overall for Gold Coast, it has to be said. And the, the annoying thing is they've done this and you look at next year and guess which team has the most points already accumulated for next year. I think this would have been easier to stomach had they traded out a next year draft, but no. They currently hold their own pick four. Obviously, that's projected on 23 slider. And then the Bulldogs first rounder as well. And uh, they're in a really good position. So um, I would say hats off to them, but uh, the academy system is a little bit contentious. But either way, they're probably the biggest winners in terms of what they actually got. So let's talk about Hawthorne now. And another team that probably had a successful draft with a really good mix of players. Nick Watson looks like... um, Potentially a generational small forward, specifically, okay? Um, Because the amount of raw potential this guy has is insane. His ability to impact games, versatility, super smart, super crafty. And uh, I think he and Ginevan, if Ginevan can harness his own potential, that could be a dynamic duo as early as next year, in my opinion. Will McKay was the key defender that needed to get, and uh, that that kind of fell into their laps as a father-son, as did Cal Shadir the key forward. So they get a little bit of balance there after losing Kaczynski um, and obviously trading in, well, Gunston and Choll. Um, so the, their tools are kind of reinforced at both ends. Bodie Ryan is a good classy intercept defender as well out of South Australia. So a bit of a mix there for Hawthorne. Now, Melbourne are an interesting one. One of the teams that had a clear disdain for anything outside the top 20 of this year's draft, um, as we saw through their trades. But if we just talk about who they took in Caleb Windsor and Colton Falstra, Interesting, very interesting. Two players that on the surface went a little bit earlier than other clubs would have picked them. Now, I think Melbourne have earned a degree of respect with, uh, you know, when it comes to drafting because they won a premiership and they are a good, successful club at the moment. So I'll defer to them on that. But what I will say attribute-wise, I think they're two players, if I had to pick a theme, that are relatively ready-made and able to probably contribute to team success as early as next year. Colton Falstrup's been playing seniors. He could easily play as a defensive forward pretty early, physically developed. And Caleb Windsor playing a more outside style that doesn't rely on a contested game to impact early. You could see him driving the ball inside 50 as early as next year for Melbourne. And I I think that might have been on their minds. So they're both long-term prospects, but the ready-made nature of them, I think, really appealed to Melbourne. And that's arguably why they picked them. So then we'll move on to North, who had uh, the best draft hand in terms of overall picks possibly we've ever seen, actually. So they get Colby McKercher, Zane Dersma, two relatively no-brainers, I thought, even though the late rumors of Daniel Curtin uh, were there. I think Zane Dersma is uh, you know, the most prolific forward just about in this year's draft with an amazing back end of the season. Colby McKercher, probably my favorite player in the draft and could be an early shout for Rising Star next year. So that adds a little bit of a different blend to what they've drafted in recent times. Some outside classes, arguably what they needed. Taylor Goad at pick 20 was a good move with Adelaide lurking right behind that. And they get one of the better young rock prospects who's really on a steep incline in terms of how much club started to rate him towards the end, at least by perception. They get their key defender in Will Dawson, uh, which is a good move. And Riley Hardiman at 23, I think, is also a really shrewd move. Some run and carry out of the back line could push up to a wing. So it's just a very balanced draft hand for here for North Melbourne. They did also trade a later pick, um, I think they were in the 50s or 40s, to uh, Port Adelaide. And they've just accumulated an extra third rounder or fourth rounder next year. Which brings us to Port Adelaide, who entered this draft with only pick 74 and walk away with it with pick 48, 52, and 57 due to some live trading. So they've traded out the back end of next year. And I'm worried, I'm a little bit worried next year they only have a round two pick. (laughs) They're going to have to do something about that. But they get in some 18-year-old talent. Um, Opposite of my love life. Um, So they took, and I said his name wrong the first time. It's not Anastopoulos, it's Anastasopoulos. Anastasopoulos. I think I've got that right. Two uh, pressure forwards, two small forwards, 176 centimeters in Anastasopoulos. And Lachlan Charlson, uh, a few picks later, again, another 177 centimeter pressure forward. So clearly, well, I I would say, is it clearly a need? Maybe, but also when you're picking that late, it makes sense to go just on talent. So maybe they weren't phased that they were both similar sorts of players. And a pick 57, Will Lorenz, I think was a really good move. Uh, One of my favorites in terms of late gems. So... Port Adelaide turned a stanky situation uh, with not really having access to this draft and they walk away with three kids that I admittedly don't know a heap about other than Will Lawrence 
and uh, I think they have achieved some good outcomes there. Richmond, uh, we're going to take three picks this year. I think that became two, and they traded down three times in this year's draft. They ended up going with two South Australians, Kane McAuliffe, 187 centimeter midfielder, and Liam Fawcett, who's a nice size for a key forward out of South Australia. Again, 197 centimeters. Adding a young key forward was probably on their radar. I know they traded for Kaczynski, but longer term, a little bit more uh, bites of the apple, so to speak. So what I like about Richmond's draft, as I said in my draft reaction video, is that they've accumulated a ton of picks in next year's draft now. And the strategy around that is solid because they can use those picks and condense them down with clubs um, who have academy picks or father sons. And we know there's a stack of them next year. So I think Richmond's playing the long game on that and I have to respect it. And they walk away with two picks uh, in the 40s. Again, the only thing is they've just done two drafts in a row where they have picks only in the 40s and 50s. But um, who knows? They do have a knack for churning out late picks um, as we've seen over the last decade. So then there's Sydney. They had three selections in this year's draft. We weren't sure if they were going to take three, but they ended up with uh, the Ruckman, Will Green. Uh, they really needed a Ruck on the list and he had to be taken at this pick, more or less. They matched an academy bid for Cleary and then they took a Brisbane Lions academy player late in Patrick Snell. Patrick Snell, I think, is a key forward that turned into a key back. So they add their key back prospect after taking Hamling as well. I probably would have liked to see a little bit more investment in a highly rated key back um, considering Sydney's woes over the last year or so. Um, but perhaps they're going to look at the free agency market next year. But what they have ticked is their midfield sort of rejuvenation. Obviously, Taylor Adams joined them. And they got James Jordan. They get C Caden Cleary as well. So uh, addressing the midfield uh, situation is a, is a tick. Will Green is also a tick. Um, Snell, I don't know enough about to really comment how likely it is he is going to make it, but he's a speculative tall taken at peak 53. So at least they got something that fits a need. Then at St Kilda, we had an interesting draft um, with a clear need for speed uh, on the agenda. So Darcy Wilson falls to pick 28, great result, arguably the sort of player that they're exactly looking for in someone who can hit the scoreboard and has pace on the outside as a wingman. Lance Collard is a very similar player too, in most respects, at pick 28. Probably more of an actual forward than Wilson or more, I see Collard becoming more of a forward at AFL level and at 180 centimeters could be that small forward as well. So they did lose Gresham and you just look at the mix of St. Kilda picks over the years and Wanganin Miller, Filippo, uh, Wilson and Collard now, they've really injected spark into this team and I really like the way they're, they're heading with their young under 22 team. Obviously there's Machido Owens and Windhager too, different players, but uh, there was X Factor clearly on the agenda. Angus Hasty as well is a running defender with a lot of X Factor, you'd say, with his attributes. So that was interesting. I don't know if they intended to take all four picks, but of course they took Ari Schoenberger uh, when he slid all the way to pick 62 as a key defender slash halfback um, with a long raking left boot. Some deficiencies in his game on the slow side, but he's damaging when he has the ball and can roost at like 65 meters. So St. Kilda, I think have done well again, continuing this trend of drafting well in recent years. Now I'm gonna skip West Coast. I should have said this at the start of the video, sorry guys. This will be its own video. So let's talk about the Western Bulldogs. So they did really well out of this year's draft too, having famously traded their future first into this year, as well as their first rounder to get Riley Sanders and Jordan Croft uh, becomes a late first round pick for them as a key forward. They didn't really need a key forward. They might develop as a key back, I'm not too sure. But on talent, to get two first round picks, one of them the Lark medalist as well, is outstanding going. And they've basically turned next year's first rounder into pick six this year in Riley Sanders. So from a trading point of view, they smashed it and Riley Sanders is a gun then they're probably going to be looking for outside speed and class. And that's what we see, particularly with Aiden O'Driscoll as a young woman that is seriously fast. And Joel Frazier as well, uh, probably more of a goal-kicking wingman who can swing forward and impact the scoreboard with genuine X factor. So probably two wingmen added to that. Um, and the Joel Frazier as well is quite ready-made, I would say, arguably quite physically developed. So we could see him sooner rather than later in a team that you'd think would be pushing to try and make finals again. Then they also added Lachlan Smith, a Ruckman, having lost Jordan Sweet. He's 201, or 202 centimeters out of uh, Victoria and overager. He's 19, uh, but I think this is just a long-term development option for them. So that's all the teams uh, summarized. If I had to isolate some winners, I don't really believe in saying losers. 
but teams that I think did particularly well, I'm going to say that the Gold Coast and North Melbourne are so clearly the obvious favourites here that uh, then the case doesn't even need to be made any further. Five first round draft picks versus four first round draft picks. Um, I suppose it's it's an interesting debate who did better out of those two. You could easily say North Melbourne in hindsight, actually. But three picks in the top 14 for Gold Coast is a very, very handy result. And they're all Queenslanders. Geelong, though, I will shout out as having an outstanding draft, uh, ticking a few boxes, getting a nice blend of players there with their attributes. And uh, Western Bulldogs as well I did really well. But this, this time of year, it's so subjective and we're, we're basing it on impressions we get from profiles and stuff like that. And uh, it's going to be very, very different to how the actual draft pans out, as you may have learned if you've been following my redraft series. So that'll do for that video, guys. Thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, Like I said, stay tuned for my Eagles video coming out. Give me a day or two. I'm not too sure. I've got to go out now. Um, But I appreciate all your support and watching the content and subscribing. And um, yeah, I'm not going anywhere too far. So I'll see you guys soon on the channel shortly. Take care. I'll see you in the next one.